Hello, so my cesium-137 check source arrived from Spectrum Techniques in America and um, it's quite good for what it is, but obviously I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of these check sources in this video and this is mainly aimed at people in the UK who might want to get check sources like this but don't know about how you'd get them legally and all this, which I can explain in this video because um, there's quite a lot of confusing things because first there's UK laws on um, radioactive materials then there's the EU laws, which are the really annoying bit. And I'm not even saying this as like a pro-Brexit person, I'm just saying this as the EU laws are so muddled and confused on them that if you live anywhere in the European Union and you're interested in these sort of things, you're going to have both your country's laws and the EU, EU laws sort of conflicting with each other and making these things as hard to get as possible, even if they say you can legally have them. Um, so there's that. So... In a minute I'll sit down near the Geiger counter and do some talking, you know, to the camera rather than behind it. And I'll demonstrate this. Now, you might be able to see on there, but I'll show you it a bit closer in a minute. This is only a 0 0.25 micro curie piece of cesium-137 and it's sealed in sort of a plastic type case. Meaning, although yes, you should still observe radiation rules when handling it, it's very, very safe in you know comparison to lots of things. The nice thing about sealed check sources is obviously the word sealed. Because this is sealed in plastic and you can get other check sources sealed in metal and things like that, it means you can't accidentally inhale them or put them in food or something like that, you know, where you'll poison yourselves quite easily with them. When it's a sealed check source, it's obviously much, much safer for handling because you don't need gloves to handle it or anything like that. And it comes in a nice case. And um, because this is only a 0 0.25, you know, like a quarter of a microcurie size piece of cesium, it means that, you know, the readings from it are fairly low, so it's very easy to store this safely. If you're in the US, you can have up to 10 microcuries, I believe, legally, um, or at least on per order or something like that, or per source. Um, but, so that's about 40 times the power of this one. But even then, that's still not going to be massively high. Um... As I've said before in some videos, and people might not be aware of this, something like radium-226, where there's no legal limit on how much you can have, is actually a lot scarier in my opinion, especially because often it's not as a proper seal check source, so you have all the risks of dust being inhaled or ingested and all things like that, which will probably inevitably kill you. So, um, we're going to talk a bit about this. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a bit about first just how it came and all that. So... In the UK, you can legally own quite a lot of check sources, but the laws on them are a bit muddled. As in, the problem you have with lots of these laws, similar to weapons laws, is the person who writes the laws, the legislator, is probably not very versed in the field of them. You know, it's a bureaucrat writing the laws, not a physicist when it comes to, say, radioactive materials. So the person who writes the laws may make stuff legal that could be quite harmful and stuff illegal that's completely harmless. Because the person, you know, doesn't really understand what they're writing about. So, although I obviously follow all the laws because I'm not a criminal, it is quite frustrating sometimes. So, I'm not going to give anybody too many examples of this because it would be good if you read the laws up yourself and try and make you know an understanding of them. But basically the point is with a lot of UK things, say for example, you can own as much radium as you want, even though radium is quite scary, but uh, certain check sources you can only have in very small amounts, others you can have in large amounts, and it seems to have no practicality towards, you know, like the gamma or beta emissions from them, things like that. It's very, very odd. I think the legislator probably looked into what you could make go super critical, as in make a nuclear weapon with or something, not, um, you know, the potential radiation dangers of the item. So it is all very bizarre. But anyway, I'm going to sit in front of the camera now so you actually have something to look at, and um, we'll do some quick tests with a DP-75 on it. Well, you'll see this isn't all that scary at all. And then you'll, I'll probably be able to explain, if you're buying one of these, what to expect, what not to expect, so nobody's disappointed when they get it. Hello, so here I am actually facing the camera, and let's get this check source and talk about it a bit. So, cesium-137 is a sort of radionuclide made when you have nuclear fission. So, there's some quite famous uh, radionuclides. I'll mention a few of them here, I certainly don't know all of them. Iodine-131, that's the famous one of why you take iodine pills or iodine pills if there's been sort of a nuclear accident. Cesium-137, Cobalt-60, Strontium-90, Mericinium-241 as well, I believe. Um, there's some quite famous ones. Um, Cesium-137 is one that's potentially very scary in big numbers. Or not even that big numbers, but much bigger than, you know, a microcurie. 
Um, so let's talk about the size of these, just with radiation terms, so people know what we're on about. So you get normally when you get radiation things, you get the term micro, milli, and then the actual ones. So if, say it's um, Rontgens or um, say sieverts. Sieverts is a good example because most decimeters start off on micro sieverts. So micro sieverts, a thousand micro sieverts in a milli sievert, a thousand milli sieverts in a sievert. If you think of it like grams, um, there is a obviously nobody ever really uses micrograms, I imagine, unless you're into some sort of very specific science field. But lots of you will know about milligrams. If you ever take tablets, a lot of them have mg written on them. That's milligrams. So that means they're less than a gram. So paracetamol is a good example, because I'm sure everybody in the UK has taken that at some point. When you get paracetamol tablets, it's normally, you're always are told to take one or two um, 500 mg tablets, 500 milligrams. The reason being, two 500 milligram tablets makes a gram. So, you know, if you have a thousand milligrams, the easy way of saying that is a gram. So, Curie's, I believe, um, from my amateur reading of nuclear things, um, if you have one Curie, that is equal to one gram. So... A microcurie, if this was one microcurie, you'd need this 1,000 times to be a millicurie, and then you'd need a 1,000 of those to be, you know, one curie, one gram. So that gives you an idea of how tiny this really is. Because what you've got here, if I open this up, um, it comes in a nice kind of little plastic case with a bit of foam. You've got, obviously, the checks all sealed in there, and it will be an absolutely tiny, tiny piece. And then you've got the label telling you when it, what it is and when it was manufactured. Um, it doesn't, oh it does actually have the half-life on this, this is very handy as well, so it's a lot of good info on here. So obviously it's telling you that it's 0 0.25 microcurie, so a tiny amount. It's got a half-life of 30.1 years, um, very similar to Strong Team 90's half-life. And this one is from November 2019, so roughly when I ordered it, and we're in December now, this is less than a month old basically, so barely going, you know, barely decayed. Which is what you want from a check source, if you're using this for calibration, you want to know exactly, you know, how old it is. So, you know, you get a good idea of nuclear decay and all that sort of stuff. So the reason I'm holding it in my hand, and I have no fear of doing this, is this is very, very weak. Um, very, very weak. So, um, I will demonstrate that with the Geiger counter in a minute. So, basically, if you're in the US, and you want to use one of these for calibration or doing tests with, you may as well buy the full strength you can. Something like, you know, 10 microcurie, I believe the limit is, until you get into certain things. Again, I'm, I'm not going to try and talk to you about US laws because I don't know them well enough, but if you're in the US and you're one of my American viewers, because you make the bulk of my audience up, um, and you want these for doing tests with, you probably want to get the 10 microcurie, especially because they work out about the same price. The problem is, if you're somewhere like the UK, we can legally buy them from America and have them shipped to us. Um, because of the weird EU laws, it's easier and it's legal and easier to do that than it is to try and find a European company that can supply it or even a UK company and get them to supply it because all the weird EU laws on member states not being allowed to ship nuclear materials unless for very specific purposes. It's all very confusing and strange and as I said written by people who don't really understand the things they're talking about. So what you want to do if you're in the UK and you want a check source is you go to somewhere like Spectrum Techniques or one of the other similar companies um, that are willing to ship to the UK, you're going to have to pay quite a lot for shipping, it's about $50, which works out 40 odd pounds, although I will say FedEx were very good. When FedEx had the parcel, they had it on a Wednesday, and they got it to me the following Monday, so less than a week of transport time to come from the US to me, so very, very good. Can't, you know, fault FedEx for that at all. So that was very good. Um, the point is, I don't think they allow you to buy more than 0 0.25 to be sent via FedEx or whatever. So this is the largest amount I could legally buy, um, and it's you know very expensive. It works out like $150, 130 odd quid pounds to do this. So you know in that regard, I wouldn't recommend it because it's you know very very weak. Um, if if you know if you're valuing check sources by the price of them, no, this is a rip off. But it's not if you know you you're getting it because you're really into it and you want to do tests with it. So somebody casually wanting a check source. Don't, don't buy this, you know, buy something like a bit of Fiesta Ware, some Thorium Lamp Mantles, something like that. Um, but yeah, that's this is the easiest way you can probably do it. Um, as I said, you can, there is ways you can legally get them in the EU countries, in the UK, but generally it will probably involve writing lots of emails or letters or phone calls to various, you know, companies that supply these things, chatting with them about it, seeing if they can set you up a way of shipping it and all this, and, and it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of messing about. I got kind of fed up after going through a couple of, um, you know, EU suppliers just because 
the process of trying to get information from them and then work out things, you know, took so long was so pointless that I did what lots of people suggested in the EU who are into these sort of things and it's, you know, just buy one from America because there's less messing about. That's what I did and it really was less messing about. Um, so yeah, all very good at that regard. So what we're going to do now is turn the Geiger counter on and have a look at some numbers. So what I will do is just reposition the camera so we can hopefully get the DP75 screen in frame, the probe, so you can see that the gamma shield is closed or, you know, beta shield is closed, sorry, or open for which bit of the video I'm doing and what scale it's on. So all the information is there and you can see I'm not like putting a bit of radium on the side to make it move, not this little bit of plastic, so here we go. Right, for once I think I've got the framing quite good here, so let's turn the DP75 on. I know the circuit checks are right, so we'll just turn it onto the lowest setting, 0.5 milliromgun. So far side of that screen is 0.5 milliromgun. The check source is here, the active side of the check source is the blue side or the underside. The side of the label isn't as strong, it's because I believe the check source is mounted closer to the bottom of it, not the front. Also there might be a bit of shielding material in this side um, with the label. Um, because cesium-137 is both a beta and a gamma emitter, that you know makes more of a thing. If it was something like Cobalt-60 it probably wouldn't matter too much which way around it was facing. So, just to give you an idea, normally if I turn this on in any room in my house and it's not near a check source, by default on background on 0 0.5, it stays between 0 and 1. And because that's the 1 there is 0 0.1 milliromgun, that's basically nothing, so that's fine. So the needle jumping around as it is at the moment is probably no, no effect from this. So if we get this and now we'll turn it like that, you'll probably see the needle move a bit more. So I'm just going to hold it like that for now. The funny thing with gamma emitters is there's kind of a paradoxical thing with them. Well, it's not really paradoxical, but you understand what I'm saying in a minute. Um, to get an accurate reading of them, you don't want them straight next to your probe or ion chamber or whatever, because the closer they are, um, it's not going to evenly go across the probe or ion chamber or whatever. If they're too far back, obviously, um, you have the issue of it's getting quite weak and losing a lot of its power. So there's kind of a sweet spot with calibration and whatever where you want it at a set distance so you're getting a good enough reading but not so close that you're getting a false reading or an inaccurate reading not too far away that it's too weak so if I put that directly on the probe let's see what happens with this sort of Geiger probe that might not actually be too much of a problem yeah it looks like it's getting more of a reading now yeah it's gone over one so we're getting um, at the moment 0 0.1 um, milliromgun if it gets to 2 it'll be 0 0.2 milliromgun tell you what let's switch it to 5 so the milliromgun numbers are exactly as you see them on there. And I imagine it will probably stick between 0 0.25 and about 1 on there. It's not going to be very high. What I'm just going to do is move this around a bit and we'll see if that affects the reading very much. But I don't think it probably will. What if I put it shooting down the middle of the probe? Will that have an effect? Not really. Right, what I'm going to try now is just holding it a bit further back, see if that gives it a bit of a stronger reading. Before I started this video I was messing about with the CDV715 iron chamber, and while this isn't really strong enough to give a good reading on that, you can get the needle to kind of move a bit with it, and then I was finding it quite interesting, you know, moving this further back and closer, seeing how that would affect a reading. But, as you can see, there's not much movement in the needle there at all really with this, um, and that's because, as I said, it's not a scary, dangerous amount of radiation. Also, Geiger counters are not the best things for doing gamma and x-rays with, supposedly, just because of how the tubes work. They're not bad, um, but iron chambers are better for measuring, things like that. So scintillators, or whatever they're called, are probably far, far better as well. Um, I don't have a scintillator. Um, but anyway, what I'll do now is I'll open the beta shield, just to show you that this obviously gives off a bit beta. The readings will be a bit higher. So there we go. There's the beta shield open. If you look at that bit there... Uh, if it's facing the camera, that's obviously a bit allowing the Geiger tube to be accessed by beta radiation. So if we put that there now, what we should do is, yet yeah, you'll see the needle move a lot more. So let's see with this pretty much point blank on it, how much radiation we get off. It's not going to be a very scary number at all, to be honest. I might even have to go up one more scale, and I think that will be it. Right, if it's going to stop around where it is, it doesn't seem like it's got much energy to creep onto the next bit of the scale. It's 4 to 5 milliromgun per hour. So basically nothing. Let's just go to the times 50 scale and zero it. 
and it will probably really struggle to creep up on here. So obviously that would still be zero, that would now be 50 milli Rontgen. The one would be 10 milli Rontgen. Ignore the bottom scale, that's for the um, 500 Rontgen an hour tube. So yep, yeah, if it gets to 0 0.5, that would be 5 milli Rontgen per hour. If it gets to 1, that would be 10 milli Rontgen per hour. So it's probably, because it's between the 0 0.25 and the 5, it's probably something, it's closer to the 5, I guess it's something like... Um, 4 milli Rontgen per hour. Let's go back down to that one and see if it stops around the 4 again. Yeah, as expected, it's probably not going to really get above the 4. Certainly not the 5. So yeah, a 0 0.25 micro curie, that's the bit to stress, sort of cesium-137 check source, is actually incredibly safe. Don't put it under your pillow or something like that, don't swallow it, but other than that, you know. Um, these are much, much safer to use for calibration and things like that than other things. So, hopefully you found this video interesting, kind of explaining something like that, especially when it comes to gamma, it's not all that scary at all. So don't buy one of these if you want to calibrate something like a CDV715 um, iron counter. If you get the 10 micro curie one in the US, or somewhere similar where you're allowed something like that, you know, something 40 times the power of this one, you might actually be able to calibrate that fairly well with this, but you certainly wouldn't with this one. Um, I get my radium to cause the CDV715 needle to move way more than this thing does. Um, let me just close the beta shield again, and we'll go um, to the smallest setting. Ignore all the horrible, horrible noise this makes. So let's yeah, close him up, we'll put him back there, we'll put this here, and then you can just have a fun time watching the needle potentially move or not move. And what we'll do for you, because you'll love the classic Geiger counter sound, in a moment I'll just do a little extra bit with the DIY Geiger counter. Just showing you what sort of happens if you get that to, um, you know, if you put this near it so you can actually hear it ticking. But as you can see with this, you know, not much gamma energy at all because it's, um, as I said, a very, very small sample size. And this is part of the problem when you get radiophobia, is people not really understanding, um, you know, how certain sizes and quantities, time, distance, you know, shielding and all that works. I'm probably not going to even keep this in my lead line box because there's no point. Um, as long as I don't, you know, as like I said, put it under my pillow or somewhere where somebody's going to be sat next to it all day. This this really isn't scary at all. Um, you know, that's the thing that a lot of people don't seem to get with these sort of things. But there you go. With a more sensitive counter, you might get, you know, a higher reading. But, you know, that's fairly close to the counter, giving it a bit of dispersal range to the Geiger Muller tube. And yeah, it's, you know. Not all that much gamma coming off of it at all. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Right, now just to show you what it looks like on a classic Geiger counter, for those of you who want to hear a bit of ticking. So, there we go, DIY Geiger counter. It's not plugged into any Arduino stuff, or however it's pronounced at the moment. So let's flick him on. But you'll hear this ticking, at least, even without the screen. So you'll get an idea of, at least, the tube getting counts. So... Let's now turn him to face the tube. Bear in mind that this will be picking up beta and gamma because there's no, obviously, shielding between the tube and the air. So there you go, not very scary at all. As I said, don't put it under your pillow, don't swallow it. But a 0 0.25 micro curie piece of cesium-137 is really, really not all that scary. Um, obviously, with all these things, the bigger the sample size, the more careful you need to be with it. It's always important to have monitoring equipment so you can actually see you know, what's coming off of it and know what precautions you need to take. But hopefully this video has explained a bit about the kind of laws and 
you know, all the difficulties you'll have in the UK and EU countries getting proper check samples, even though they're the safest things you can use, rather than, you know, getting old radium dials, like you're sort of forced to in a lot of these countries because the law says that's okay, but proper check samples can't be legally bought. I don't know who comes up with these laws. Um, so there you go. Hopefully that's told you a bit about how you'd go about purchasing one of these, what these can and can't do, the sort of pricing range of them, so you know, you'd know if this is something you'd want and you'd be pleased or disappointed with it, so you make an informed decision on buying it. A bit of safety precautions, which aren't really all that many, and sort of what sort of readings you'd get from a 0 0.25 micro Curie bit of cesium. Um, 137. So there you go. Thank you to Spectrum Techniques um, in the US, um, who, you know, were very professional at getting this to me. The only issue I had with them was when I first purchased it, it took a while for them to tell me that, um, you know, I it like hadn't essentially gone through with my debit card. So what I then had to do was just PayPal them and then they were very efficient at dispatching it for me. But yeah, I think that was more of just it being a UK visa, not an American visa debit credit, and then, you know, my bank not putting it through properly. But anyway, it's all sorted now and I've got it. So yeah, very good. Um, you know, and hopefully this video has really explained to you a bit about check sources and, you know, sample sizes and all things like that and it will make you make an informed decision if you want to get one or not, really.